What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, some you've heard of, some you've never heard of. You know, P90X founder, Tony Horton. You know, Kevin, when I talk about this, I like talking about some of the challenges and low moments because we've all had those in our journey and it makes us real. And, you know, he talked about when he was, you know, he's obviously sold hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X, but he was a street mime. So he made money. Uh, food and rent money by putting his hat on the street and being a street performer. Um, I had a guy, uh, Moise Navone, who is a founding engineer at Mobileye, which basically fuels the autonomous vehicle. And they sold their company to Intel for $13.2 billion. But what struck me was he had to go back, at, he had to keep taking pay cuts, pay cuts, pay cuts, because they're working really long hours for little pay. And he had to go back to his wife and kids and basically t- say, hey, um, all extracurriculars done, no more eating out, no more niceties. Like we can't afford it. And basically had to pull them out of all their extracurriculars because of the grind that it took to get wow. there. You know what I mean? So check out that many more at inspiredinsider.com. I really like talking about the true to life stories, um, along the journey. And, uh, this episode is brought to you by rise 25. I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, who Kevin also knows, and we help B2B businesses connect their dream 100 clients. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And we uh, want to make sure that the podcast has amazing content, but it also helps you generate ROI. And the ROI is from relationships. And there's no better perfect guest from today to talk about relationships than Kevin Thompson. When I think of relationships, he's like the top three people that enter into my mind. Um Beyond just relationships with podcasting, I consider it leaving a legacy for my guests, um, for myself and my guests. And you can check out the about page on inspiredinsider.com. There's an interview with my grandfather who who was a Holocaust survivor. And he talks about um, surviving Nazi Germany. And um, that legacy lives on because of the the interview the Holocaust Foundation did with him. So um, we have been doing this for over 10 years. If you have questions, feel free to email us uh, at support at rise25media.com or go to rise25.com. So Kevin, I am super excited to chat with you. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm going to, I'm going to give a formal intro to Kevin in a second, if you don't know him, which you should. Um, and you know, I was, I had an interview earlier today with a man by the name of Steve Adams. Okay. Steve oh. Adams runs tiger neuro.com. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Steve, you know, what's going on? He's like, I just got off of a two hour zoom call. I go, what were you doing on a two hour Zoom call? And he goes, I was with this group called Tribe for Leaders. Uh, and people can check out tribeforleaders.com if it's under, uh, you know, they're revamping it. So, but you should go there anyways. Um, I'm sure by the time you visit it, it'll be there. And I go, you know, I, I know Tribe for Leaders. And uh, he's like, yeah, Kevin Thompson runs it. I'm like, Kevin's the best. And uh, he's like, it's this amazing group where like-minded founders, entrepreneurs get on, they share, they help each other. And then they, you know, the group kind of rotates every so often. So you get to meet more people and, you know, push through different challenges, opportunities, meet more people as far as opportunities go, strategic partnerships. So um, it was just funny. That was the timing. And um, also Eric Dewey the other day, I was talking to him and he's like, Kevin's the best. You need to have Kevin on the show. I'm like, I already have him on the show. He's coming on the show. Okay. <laughs> and Eric runs Fair Merchant Solutions, who help, he helps high risk industries like hotel, travel, many, many other different industries with payment processing, grocery, you name it. So um, Kevin is one of the biggest givers I know. He is an expert, in my opinion, at what is the most important aspect of life and business, which is relationships. Um, he creates profitable win-win relationships in a number of ways. And we'll hear about his methodology, his strategy, what he does. Um, he's gone from being in the army to, if you picture the deadliest catch, he was there. Deadliest catch fisherman, crazy stories there. To carpet cleaner, to online marketer, to, I call you, Kevin, um, strategic relationship business builder. That's what I just call mm-hmm. you in my mind. Um, you can check out tribeforleaders.com. So 
Um, Lee Richter, I'll just highlight that. She just said uh, Rockstar Connectors. So, um, <laughs> Kevin, thank you for joining me. This is a long time coming. Yeah, man, Jeremy, I, man, my pleasure. I mean, this is this is cool because it's been a while since you and I have seen each other, and it's just cool to be back together, just having a conversation, man. Yeah. You know, when I was talking to Steve um, Adams, I was like, you know, we aren't living in the same city, but whenever he comes to Chicago, we definitely go to dinner and love hanging out. Um, I would love to start off just hearing your, we'll, we'll talk about the journey and some of your amazing stories, but um, strategic partnering, um, your philosophy, methodology around strategic partnering. You know, here's the thing. So, so many people, so many entrepreneurs like view strategic partnering. Uh, you, know, you, you get people reaching out to you all the time. And I, I'm sure you've experienced this where they're like, hey, you know, we should do this thing together. And, and uh, you know, if you help me out, I'll share revenue with you. Or, you know, we can, we can make all this money together. And, and I've, I've been approached with that message so many times over the years. And it just kind of falls on deaf ears. And you know what? What's most important is the relationship, like you said. You know, and and uh, the, the the there's you know my, my friend Travis talks about uh, the different kinds of relationship capital, or the different kinds of capital. Excuse me, and he uses timer as an acronym for that, and it's you know time, identity, money, energy, and reputation, or also you know, also relationships. And, and usually when we're looking at strategic partnering, we need to look at how can we help further our partner's relationship with their audience, with their followers, with their you know, sphere of influence, their, you know, whoever that is. And when we come from that standpoint of just being of service, that's when we get cooperation. And, and once, we've, once we've got somebody's attention, now it is upon us to give them a great experience in partnering with us from, from beginning to end. And that does not always include how much money we're going to make together. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's all about treating people the way that we would want to be treated. And it's, it's, it's really, Jeremy, it's that simple. It's that simple. You know, you talked about being of service. I've never seen someone who does such a high touch, you know, introduction, strategic, partnership meaning when you introduce people you follow up you know you're just like okay go at it you have a way of i want you to maybe talk a little about that you actually follow up with people and you see yeah. how it's going talk a little about the follow i mean not only you're introducing but there's a follow-up process to that well you know because it, it, it's frustrating when you when when you see something of like you're, you want to connect to people because you see something there and and then if if it if they don't have that conversation or or if like you know they just get entrepreneurs let's face it we're all busy um and and if if it doesn't get followed up on and they that those people that you're trying to connect don't get to actually talk and have a conversation i'm like wait a minute you guys need to like have this conversation <laughs> i introduced you for a reason and so right. let's make sure you guys get to talk and explore this and and uh, you know and, and really I mean I, I guess the same thing it comes down to because I care about both of those two parties right. and I want to see at least at bare minimum if, if nothing ultimately does end up coming from it I at least want them to connect because I know that they're going to have a great conversation and a new relationship will be formed. So. Yeah, I don't know if I would say you care more than them, but sometimes they don't realize how impactful that can be. So you sometimes have to care a little bit more in the beginning to make sure that, uh, you know, follows through. Right. Um, yeah. There's two stories that are really interesting when it comes to strategic partnerships with you and maybe start with the first one with uh, Joe Polish. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your Joe, with, I mean, with, without even. I, I mean, like this was before I knew even what strategic partnering was, and and uh, Joe and I uh, did form a partnership together. But at the time we were doing it, I had no idea what was going on, or that that's even what we were doing. Uh, this would have been back in 2003. Uh, you know, I, I I was friends with Joe because at the time I owned a cleaning and restoration business, and <clears throat> I met Joe in 1997. And uh, my, my business at the time was, I mean, 
lack of a better word, Jeremy, it kind of sucked. I, I was, I didn't know the first thing about business, didn't know the first thing about marketing. And uh, I found Joe in a trade publication and I started using his materials to just completely revamp and just transform that business over the next few years into a buy referral only company. And uh, I had also started this website, this ugly little website called Get Mold Solutions. Uh, and that website had uh, got up to about producing between twelve to 13000 a month on autopilot. So it was a nice little addition to the business. And Joe and I were having a conversation in early 03. And he's like, hey, why don't you come down here to the annual event? and show everybody what you're doing with your website. And I'm like, all right, that sounds cool. And he did this annual event every year for the cleaning and restoration industry. And about, you know, four or 500 people would be there at that. And, and so when I agreed to that, he's like, Kevin, be sure to document, you know, what you do and how you do what you do with that website. Because when you share a certain percentage of the people in the audience, they're going to want ongoing help for you from you and make sure you are prepared to give that to them. So I did that. And, uh, you know, it took me about three months to put something together that became the very first version of a product that became known as the automatic income system. And uh, I, I had called Joe's office the week before to get a hold of his secretary, Eunice, because I was like, I don't even know how this stuff works. And I just told her, I said, you know, I said, Eunice, I said, Joe's got me speaking here at the event next week. And he asked me to prepare a presentation as well as put a, a, a product together, which I've done that and I'm ready to go. But I, said, I don't even know how this works. And Eunice is like, well, typically because Joe has invested all the time and finances in putting the event together and getting people there. Typically, if somebody speaks, they do a share of the revenue. They just share it with Joe. And I'm like, oh, OK, that sounds good. And and so she walked me through how that worked. And I'm like, all right. And so we ended, I ended up speaking at that event. And that was my first time ever, Jeremy, speaking on a, on a big stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, right before I took the stage, I'll tell you, I was, I mean, I was a nervous wreck. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, I had all these things going through my mind, like, man, can you really do this? Or do you really have value to offer for these people? Oh man, don't let Joe down. You know, Joe's your friend. Don't let <laughs> down, you know? I mean, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but but once I got on stage and, I, and Joe gave me this great introduction and then I just started sharing and just in a few minutes, people were engaged and I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And so I just shared. And um, when we were done, I just uh, about, I don't know, 50 minutes later, I just said, hey, you know, if, if this resonated with you, if what I shared here makes sense, if you'd like to have my ongoing help, uh, this is what it looks like. This is what the investment is. And, uh, you know, if, if you want that, then go ahead and, and go to the back of the room. And uh, we made $35,000 in sales of that product uh, at that event. And and that, Jeremy, uh, I'll tell you what, that was a whole lot more than I made running the cleaning and restoration business for a day's work, you know, <laughs> and that was an epiphany there. And but, you know, what? looking back on that, I didn't even realize, you know, I mean, it, it, hindsight's 2020 that like, you know, Joe and I had formed a strategic partnership. He saw that I had something of value to offer his people at that event. Uh, we did not have one single comment with Joe and I, we never said one word about, he never even told me how it worked or anything. There was not even a conversation around, oh, we're gonna make all this money. I mean, none of that took place. It was just, he was like, why don't you come Delivering down? value, you deliver value, he delivers value to his audience through what you, you know, will deliver value with by helping them and giving them yeah. new ideas and new things that they can do to help their business. Yes. Yes. And and yet, you know, looking back, uh, that was a just such a valuable lesson and valuable experience going through that. Uh, and that ended up launching a new business for me that we started running with. I started, you know, started running advertising for it. And did, you know, that's a whole nother story. But uh, long story short, the following year, April uh, 14th of 2007, we sold the cleaning and restoration business and I moved into this new business. It just was basically launched at Joe's event. Yeah. And, uh, I want to talk about Joe Polish's, what some of the lessons you learned, some of the influence, um, but talk about a low point in the carpet cleaning, cleaning restoration business. Um, 
that just to give people a sense of what you were working with and dealing with at the time? Yeah. You know, um, I, I, you know, running that business, I ended up building a, a team of people. I had, uh, you know, guys that were out in the field doing cleaning work. I had an office gal and we had, you know, all this in place. And, and quite honestly for me, and I, and I was, still, I was managing the whole thing. And, and a lot of times I was out in the field too. And, and, uh, you know, even though like we, we, with Joe's help had got to about probably top 3% of cleaning restoration people in the industry, as far as size of business, you know, that I had and, and revenue being created thanks to Joe's help. Uh, but yet here I still was, I was working, you know, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. Uh, I was doing that six and seven days a week. Um, and I, it, it, for, for me, um, I, I remember sitting in my office one day on a Sunday and thinking to myself, what in the hell am I doing here? Hmm. Because this is not the lifestyle that I want for myself. Uh, my family, <clears throat> they don't deserve this. Uh, I, I should be home with my family right now, not here at work. Mm -hmm. And for the first time ever, uh, I, I took out a piece of paper and I just started writing, well, what the heck do you even want? Mm. What do you really even want for yourself? And, and for me personally, you know, I, I wanted to be able to have, you know, time off on weekends to spend with my family. Uh, I wanted to be able, because at that time, business was, and, and business consumed my mind all the time. It, I never shut down from it. 24 seven. I, I mean, from the time I got up to the time I went to bed, I was thinking business. And even if I was in conversations with other people, I'm, I'm like not engaged because I'm thinking about, Oh, you know, even if I'm taking time off, I'm thinking like, dang, you got all this stuff that needs to be done in the business. And when I'm at work, I'm thinking, man, you should be spending more time with your family and the people that you say you care about, you know? Yeah. yeah. So you got all this constant push and pull going on. And uh, you what know, else that, did you write down? So you wrote down no weekends. I don't want weekends. What else did you yeah, want? I, at the time? Weekends off. I wanted, I wanted a business that actually excited me. Now there were aspects of that cleaning and restoration business that I liked. But there was a bunch of it that I just didn't like at all. <laughs> and and I wanted to have a business. That it's, and I, I, I'd i like to say that I got into that business uh, for some grandiose reasons. But it was just because I saw, I knew a guy in Seattle that had a, it was in that industry and he was doing okay. And I was like, well, if he can do it, so can I. That was my whole motivation for starting that business. And I wanted something. I wanted to have a business that actually inspired me, that, that had me excited to get up and do what I do every day. Um, I wanted, uh, yeah, I wanted time off from my family. I wanted, I wanted to be able to make a million dollars in my business. You know, I mean, at that time, million dollars seemed like, and, and that, you know what, interesting, Jeremy, that became the goal for a long time until we hit it. Uh, that was the goal. And I remember the first year we hit it in 08, I was like, wow, we actually did it. <laughs> and it was such an exciting time. And I was like, wow. But yeah, that was one of my things. I wanted to be able to make a million dollars a year in my business. And uh, so those were some of the biggies that I wrote down. And, um, you know, uh, I want to work with inspiring people. I want to work with people that, you know, expire, inspire me. And like for me, that's entrepreneurs. I love talking with entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. with entrepreneurs and, and sharing with them and learning from them and hopefully me being able to provide insight and perspective for them as well. So, yeah, I know a lot of the values that you wrote down were around the family and wanted to be with them, not look, working the long hours, not being on the weekends. Um, what, what else, as far as, you know, the lessons you've learned, you know, you started off with in the Joe Polish world in the cleaning restoration and then carried through to today, what are some of the, maybe some top lessons or things that you've gleaned over the years? You know, you, so we're talking about Joe Polish. I am, uh, you know, I met Joe in 97 and him and I are still friends to this day. He was my introduction to direct response marketing. Uh, you know, in 2008 or was that, eight? that was 2007 was when he started Genius Network. Mm. And in 2008, I joined it. And so I've been in that group for a long time. And, you know, the, 
we talk about Joe, I mean, he is one of the really long-term relationships that I've had in my life. Uh, as far as an entrepreneur, he is the longest standing relationship. And yet we're just as close today as we always have been. And, um, uh, you know, like you alluded to relationships, I mean, people play it a lot of lip service that relationships are important, but a lot of times their actions show otherwise. Uh, but yet relationships are the most valuable asset that we have in our business. I, I personally even place them. I mean, I, it, it, there is no more valuable asset than the relationships we have, whether it's with other entrepreneurs, whether it's with our clients, with our prospects, with our team, with our vendors, with whoever that is, your know, relationships in our life are the most valuable asset that we possess. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know your philosophy on it is it just deliver as much value as humanly possible. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And treat people the way that we would want to be treated. You know, one thing that always strikes me every time I talk to you, Kevin, that it reminds me, you know, even telling that story about the strategic partnership story with Joe Polish. Mm -hmm. You're amazing at putting your ego aside and asking for help. Okay. Um, I don't know if you realize that, but it's true. Like when you approached Eunice and you said, I'm not exactly sure how this works. What do I do here? Most people may not do that. I don't, maybe not most people, but some people may not do that. Right. And you kind of just, listen, I just want to get this right. And you just come and ask for help. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and don't pretend, you know, it all. Um, and I found that to be super valuable for myself. And, and whenever I talk to you, that's a, you just bring up a story that, um, always bring up a story like, Hey, like, I'm not sure. And you just ask a question and some people don't want to ask because they want to feel like people, you know, they know it all or whatever the case is. I don't know if there is a way that you can put that aside and use a way that you can come with your heart in your hand and just ask for help is that something you've always done or is that oh, no and you know you what's interesting is you bring that up about that conversation with Eunice and um I didn't even view that particular instance as asking for help mm -hmm. I I viewed as like okay Joe's given me the opportunity here I want to make sure I get this right and do right by Joe right and so um, but no, for most of my life, Jeremy, I have totally sucked when it comes to asking for help from other people because, uh, I didn't want to bother or inconvenience people. Um, yeah. and, and it wasn't really until I, I was having a conversation with a good friend and a mentor of mine, Jesse Elder, and this took place in 2012 where we really started digging into this. And he, he starts asking me, he said, Kevin, he said, when you give to somebody else and when you help somebody else who really appreciates it, how does that make you feel? And I was like, you know what, Jess? I was like, there, there's no better feeling in the world than that. I was like, I love the feeling that I have when I do for somebody else that really appreciates that. And, and he's like, cause he knew that like, you know, cause that's how I was. I loved giving to others. And I loved helping other people, but I was not so good at receiving help from other people or, God forbid, asking other people for help when I needed it. Mm -hmm. and, and so he kind of point out, he's like, Kevin, he's like, do you realize that by you being this way, you're depriving other people from the feeling that you just told me was the best experience in the whole world? He's like, you're depriving them from having that experience. He's like, who are you to do that to them? <laughs> And I'm just like, wow, I never, ever thought about it that way before. <laughs> and Some, yeah, sometimes the biggest givers are the worst receivers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that is, I mean, I, I've, I've talked with a number of people that, about that. I've, I've given, you know, I've shared presentations on the topic of giving and receiving and why it's not better to give than to receive. Uh, and like that is a big issue for a lot of people, not just entrepreneurs, but I mean, definitely entrepreneurs too. Most of them are far better at giving than they are receiving or asking, you know, proactively asking for help for sure. Yeah. So how do you become a better receiver? I mean, you gave a perfect analogy, by the way. You talked about it in the sense of breathing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
You know, I mean, for me, you know, once I came to the realization, thanks to Jesse, I was like, you know what, he, he's right. I am depriving other people of having this experience. And, and I know how much I love having it. I was like, so let me just start exercising this a little bit. Let me just start, you know, letting, like, when somebody wants to do something for me, you know, or ask me, hey, Ken, what can I do to help you? You know, don't just say, no, 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 I'm good. You don't, you don't need to do anything. You know, and even if I can't come up with a good answer now, you know, which that happens, somebody will ask me, hey, Kev, what can I do to help you? And I'm like, you know what? I don't know right now. I don't have a good answer right now. Is it all right with you if I just circle back around with you when I have a good answer? And and nobody says no to that. And, and, it, and it still lets them have the feeling of like, yeah, you know what? I mean, he accepted my offer. He doesn't, might not have a good answer, but he's open to that. And it still lets them have that same feeling. And, and then when people do want to give and they, you know, they do want to help me, I'd be accepting of that. And I just, you know what? Instead of saying, no, 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 you don't have to do that. I just say, you know what? Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And just let them have the experience and and the other big thing for me is I've been really, you know, for the last several years, just really been flexing my muscles and just like exercising when it comes to asking for help from others proactively, because I do know that, you know, us who are givers, which so many entrepreneurs are, the people around us, people in our lives, they know who we are. They know that we're a giver. And, and so w when we do go to ask for help, from other people and we step out on a limb a little bit get a little bit out of our comfort zone have conversations with people and just say you know what i really could use some help with this i'd like to talk with you about this you know what people know who we are they already know that we've all i mean we have been creating relationship capital for years we are surrounded by people who love us who want the best for us who want to help us who want to see us win but you know what? Most of them don't know what to do because we haven't asked them for help. We haven't asked them for anything. And they'd, be, they'd love to help us. And that's been my experience when it comes to asking for help is like, oh, Kev, yeah, man, I'd love to help you out. And so it's it's been a game changer, Jeremy. It's been a game changer. You talked about it like breathing and you said it try and just exhale and not inhale or try and yeah. just inhale and not exhale see how that works for you. And that That's really fine. struck me as a great analogy. <laughs> and you know what? That Jesse said that to me. He's like, okay. yeah, giving and receiving are like, you know, it's like breathing. He's like, you know, if I were to ask you, what do you prefer better, breathing in or breathing out? <laughs> if you were actually gave me an answer, I'd say, great. Try doing only that for a while and see how far it gets you. Because yeah. you do, you got to do both. And giving and receiving are the same way. You got to do both. Yeah. So one way people can help you, you'll let me know, but um, they should check out Tribe for Leaders. They can email you, put you on, you know, message you on Facebook. Talk a little bit about Tribe for Leaders, what it is. Yeah, you know, so Tribe for Leaders, what it is, it, I just, just with me, you know, having all this experience with, with giving and receiving now, and then having more recently been, on the receiving end in such a powerful way, I wanted more people to experience this. And I started hosting these live events a couple of years ago, back in 2017. And I, a, a close friend of mine had suggested, Kevin, why, why have you never held an in-person get together for a bunch of your cool entrepreneur friends? I'm like, I don't know, I've never thought of that. And he's like, well, you should, because if you did, I'd want to come. And so I just started reaching out. I mean, that, that got me really jazzed. And I'm like, because that was like, for me, Jeremy, that was like, the, the thought of it was like throwing a party for a bunch of cool friends, you know? And I actually hosted those first two events right here at my home. And uh, so the, the first six people I reached out to, uh, I was I was six for six, that they all were like, Kev, if you do that, I will be there for it. And and these were person, I mean, it was people like, <clears throat> excuse me, it was the people like Travis Sago, Garrett Gunderson, uh, Ryan Chapman, uh, you know, I don't know if these names mean anything to anybody else, but uh, Jesse Elder, in fact, Jesse Elder was number six, and he he starts asking me, he's like, well, Kev, when are you doing this? And I'm like, I don't know, I haven't even set dates. I'm just <laughs> an idea by a few people to see if there's interest. And he's like, 
well, you got to set some dates. And I'm like, okay, I said, I'll do that. And he's like, nope. He's like, right now, while we're talking on the phone, set dates. And I'm like, all right. So we set dates. And he's like, okay. He's like, now set another set of dates a month later. I'm like, why is that? He's like, well, Kevin, you're only like looking 15 people because, you know, you only got so much room in your home. You're going to fill this thing up. He's like, set another set of dates and uh, give people two options. And, and that was a good move uh, on his part because we did. We filled both of them up. We had 15 people at each event. And, uh, and I, I knew, I, I, Jeremy, I mean, well, I, I'm sure that I talked to you in that time frame and would have invited you. I had lots of people that I invited that couldn't make the dates. Uh, but what I envisioned for this was, you know, the, the, the people I were inviting was uh, all well-established entrepreneurs who had already successful businesses, <clears throat> who had a track record of getting great results for their clients and a good reputation, all of that stuff. But on the other side of the coin, they were also these just amazingly giving and generous lead with a helping hand people of integrity on the planet that I knew. And, and I, even though I could not articulate to anybody what would happen, because I'd never done this before, I just knew that when you get people who are that way, entrepreneurs who are that way, who have that expertise, who have that experience, who have years of resources, who have years of connections that they already have through their business, and they are also people who just want to give, who just want to help, who want to see other people win, when you get them together in a space, that magic will happen. And, and it did. It happened. And, and so we went on to host uh, 10 of those events over the last couple of years. And, uh, and then when, when COVID uh, kicked up, I was like, we had an event scheduled for March. And I'm like, well, this isn't going to happen. And I'm like, what are you going to do now? And so we, I was like, well, you know what? I still want to start helping, still want to help people in this way. So we switched over to using Zoom. And somebody was like, Kevin, if you can't do live events, if you can't get us together on live events, you got to do it virtually because we still want to like hook up like this. And so that's when we created Tribe for Leaders. And what this has always been and, and what my vision was always was for this thing was that when you get this, these entrepreneurs together like this in this space, that they're all there to help each other, that, that, that they're not. I mean, yes, they have things that they need and that they want to. But they all come from this place of service, wanting to help, wanting to give. I mean, and, and what happens is like they're all trying to out give and out help each other. And, and so in return, they're all getting exactly what they need as well. And, and I'm, I, I want to be careful with my life because I, I used to say, well, I, and I'm just the guy who provides the space for them. And I, but now I, I, I'm the guy who provides the space for them to do that. Mm. And that's my role in that. So and what's the format? How often do people meet? How does it work? So, uh, the, so we, we uh, have multiple groups. Uh, we're, we're, we're look, right now, uh, we only launched this thing uh, a month and a half ago, and our goal was to get to 50 members in the group and cap it. Uh, and, and it's actually going to be about 50, 55. Right now, we're at like as of today, well, not counting this afternoon, but right now, 23. So I would imagine nice. that the way things are going now. And like you mentioned, Steve Adams. Well, people are talking and like people are saying, well, the guy we're talking to today was like referred and somebody told him, you need to talk with Kevin about being in this thing. And, and uh, so I would imagine that within a month, month and a half or so, we're probably going to be full up. I don't know exactly what we're going to do at that yeah. point. I mean, um, do you keep the, the groups a certain size or how do you? Yeah. So we right now we have multiple groups inside. And so each uh, they, we host a call for each group. So each group has five to six people in it. And then we host a Zoom call for them every month. And so right now we're, we're hosting Zoom calls every week. And then that'll, that's steady, steadily picking up as we add more people, add more groups. Uh, and then they're with the same group 
for the first quarter. So for the first three calls, they're with, with the same group. So that kind of starts creating a little bit of accountability. It creates, you know, you get to kind of come back and say, okay, this is what we did, you know, in the last 30 days. And, and, uh, and it's, they start getting to really know each other. And so then after the first quarter, now, because Jules and I are participating on every single call with all of these groups, well, we're, we're like hearing what everybody's talking about, what they're looking for, what they're needing help with. And so we're able to start pulling from each group and say, oh, well, you need to connect with so-and-so. And so we're kind of playing matchmaker and all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, and after the first quarter, we'll kind of like you know, look at it where everybody's and we're going to change the seats if you will now you're going to be in a new group for the next quarter kind of a thing yeah i mean you're yeah. overseeing it all so you get the insights and you get you you you're a master i mean connector doesn't make do it justice but you're allowed to you, you then can basically take people and start to introduce them to what the needs they they can serve each other for exactly. even if they're in different groups exactly. um i kind of this is the way i explain it kevin okay uh Someone's like, hey, should I join something Kevin's doing? It could be anything. I would first of all say yes because of who you are. But second of all, they're like, well, what do I get? Or what 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 happens? I go, listen, it's kind of like chocolate. It's like my daughters if they haven't tried something. Do you like chocolate? Yes. Do you like peanut butter? Yes. We'll put them together. Do you like that? Yes. Okay. You're fine. Just go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> like you take entrepreneurs. You like entrepreneurs? Yes. Do you like making connections with entrepreneurs? Yes. Something good will come out of it if you put the two together. And that's yeah. kind of what you do. You don't necessarily have an expected outcome. You just know when you put this in a bowl, something good will come out of it. Yeah. Is that accurate? Yeah, accurate. Yeah. And like, you know, just this morning we had a tribe for leaders call and, and one of the guys just did a kind of like a, a small one of these five day challenges just had some great results with it. And now he's, he's got this thing all systematized and he's talking about, he's like, you know what I want, man, I, I was so excited about what happened, the results that we got for people and the, the results they got. Uh, I want to start doing this every quarter and I want to start around it. Well, one of the other guys was a, you know, he, he's a media buyer. And he starts asking a few questions and like about this and that. And he's saying, well, what if you did this? And, and now all of a sudden the guy that was, he's all like, Pete, he's like, you know what? He's like, we need to have a deeper conversation after this call, because I think you can help me grow this thing. And it's a whole lot bigger than I even imagined. And I'm starting to get the picture of that. Thanks to you. And I'm see when, and when I see that kind of stuff happening, and I, I'm so stoked to see what the conversation is going to take place next month when we get back together with those people and stuff because i know how I, I know what happened in the last 30 days i can only imagine what's going to happen in the next 30 days and stuff and now i'm thinking about because of these two guys i'm thinking about people in the other groups like oh well you know what you need to talk to so and so and you need to talk to so and so and so for me to play the matchmaker like that i mean I, that, that's the role that i love playing i love yeah. playing that role yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love hearing Kevin, your mindset around being a giver about it's not about what I can get. It's not about the money you can make. It's just about going in and delivering value. And also the flip side of what you said you've been terrible at, which is being a receiver and some of the mindset that goes into that, which mm -hmm. is, you know, you're taking something really special away from the person if you're not receiving properly. Yeah. Um, there's also a a really good example of strategic partnering um, with with Mike Crow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike, he he was my uh, my second ever strategic partnership. After I did that one with Joe in two thousand three, I, I I took the presentation I did. And I I uh, I started doing advertising and direct mail and all that, and we put it into a teleseminar model and started doing that. And and it wasn't until two thousand seven. When I was talking with my friend Mike Crow, who I met through Joe, I mean, I, I met a lot of people through Joe over the years, and uh, we were we were just catching up, and I was telling about this thing I'd been doing, and he was like, "You know, Kev," he's like, "I think that my home inspectors would really get a ton of value for that. Why don't Why don't we do something together?" And he's like, "I'll I'll put you in front of them." I'm like, okay, sounds good. And so we set a date. Uh, we, he promoted it to his group of home inspectors. I did a similar presentation as I did at Joe's live event, uh, for carpet cleaners. I did it for his home inspectors and we just did it on a teleseminar. 
And when we were said and done, we created about 48,000 in revenue in less than 24 hours doing that. And like no plane, no travel, no nothing, just talk on the phone for about 90 minutes. And I was just like, wow, that was really cool. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the thing is, I was so appreciative of Mike. I was just like, man, as a, you know what? This would have not happened if it weren't for Mike and, and him just having his role in it. And, uh, and so I was like, you know what, I was like, I, I need to, you know, I, we, I had told Mike, I was like, you know, Hey, I will share a percentage of revenue that we, that we create from this. And we had agreed on that. And I was like, you know what, As, if I was Mike, I'd appreciate getting uh, the money quickly. And so we had offered the training on three installments of 397. And we had all these round of installments of 397 that come in. I was like, you know what, I was like, I'm just going to overnight Mike a check based on what's already come in. And, you know, I'll, I'll, if we get returns or whatever, I'll just, it'll factor out and I'll take care of it in the second and third checks. I'll be sending him in 30 and 60 days. So I overnighted him a check. And, and I just wrote a handwritten note, you know, hey, Mike, man, so appreciate you doing this. I'm really excited that we had such great results. I mean, I'm looking forward to helping your people. And, and, uh, and he calls me the next day. And he was like, Kevin, he's like, I got to tell you, I have partnered with a lot of people over the years. And no one has ever overnighted me a check. Hmm. And he said, like, I just want to let you know what uh, impact that that made on me. And and I just made a note of that. I'm like, you know what? Overnight the check is apparently a good thing. I'm just going <laughs> to keep on doing that. <laughs> and and so that just became part of my process. And and I, you know, and and, and I, so I, I just had a conversation with Mike. I'm like, hey, I said, like, do you? Now that we've had this experience, do you know anybody else that I should be talking with? And he's like, yeah, he's like, absolutely. He's like, I want to connect you with some more people. And so we did that. And I started partnering with some of them too. Not all of them, but some of them. And, and I told them, I said, you know what? I was like, you and I, we wouldn't even be talking if it weren't for Mike. And so I want to honor him in this too. I'd like to withhold a little bit. And when we do, if we do this project together, I'm going to give Mike a little bit too. And, and, and people just were like, wow, you know, Kim, that's a really good idea. Well, yeah, we do need to honor Mike because, yeah, you're right. We wouldn't be talking if it weren't for him. And so um, I, I ended up just developing this process. And it, it, it was really nothing more than like what I mentioned before is it's, it's how just treating people the way that we'd want to be treated. Right. And, and, you know, I developed a process that just ended up, that's, that's why I was able to do over 500 strategic partnerships in, in about a nine, 10 year period. Uh, and, and we, we sold 16 million, $16.1 million of that product and the training that went along with it and hundreds of partners along the way. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, I, I remember being at a, an event, uh, one time, I think it was Yannick Silver's underground and, and had rented a Mike Phil same there and got to talking with him at the lounge and, and he was like, you're, you're the guy. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you're the guy I heard about. You're the guy that overnights the checks. <laughs> you're the guy. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, and, and that's not a bad reputation to have, but you know, it's, it's not just about the money and the checks either. It's just, it's, it's, it's the gesture. how you treat people, yeah. how you treat people. You know, it, Kevin, I've been the subject of that. I remember I was in my office, I get this FedEx package envelope mm -hmm. and I'm like, I have no idea what this is. I open, it's a handwritten note from you uh -huh. and a check. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's amazing. I uh, texted you called you probably at the time and said, thank you. That's, that's amazing. But your internal dialogue is what I really always love to hear is it's all delivering value, giving, um, you know, when you approach those partners, you could do something, but you, you talk about and use the words, we want to honor Mike. We want to honor that other person. And that's kind of the internal talk that you have about that person. And so how can you not go along with that? Yeah. You yeah. know, um, I, you know, I want to go back a little bit in your journey. You know, it wasn't always, you know, the automatic income system or what you do now. Um, you had to endure some true grit and hustle mm -hmm. and, um, and maybe that's understating it even, but, um, there was a time, you know, that you had aspirations to go to college mm -hmm. and that got sidetracked. So yeah. I wonder if you could just talk about that for a second. Sure. 
Um, when I was in high school, I was in uh, FBLA, Future Business Leaders of America, when I was in high school. And, uh, and I had such a cool experience in that, that uh, I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go to college and I want to study business because I, 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 that's what really got me going in the mind of like, I want to be an entrepreneur. And um, unfortunately, uh, my, my dad, at the uh, beginning of my ninth grade year, he mm. got diagnosed with cancer. And at the end of my 10th grade year, he passed away. Terrible. And, oh, sorry. Uh, so that, that was an experience in and of itself. Uh, losing your dad at 16 years old is, is rough on a kid. And, but you know what? It's, you know, I, I had a lot of, uh, you know, I cried a lot with him before he passed away. But once he finally passed away, because I watched him deteriorate so much in that you know, year and a half uh, that uh, it was like this burden, his weight was lifted when he passed away because it was like, finally, he's out of He's suffering. Pain. Yeah, yeah. He was out of his pain and, and uh, but you know, through that, uh, my mom becoming now the sole income earner for our family, uh, plans of going to college were off the table. She just wasn't going to be able to afford that. And so I ended up joining the military, joined the army right out of high school because I just, I, I, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do or how I was going to make this happen or anything like that. And so I was like, well, you know what? My dad was in the army. I'm going to join the army at least maybe, you know, and, and get the, because you get a college money too when you join the army and i was like that was kind of my motivation there and so i spent yeah, like the gi bill they can help yeah. fund it yeah help, help pay for college yeah when you get out and uh so i i was like you know i'll do that and uh and after i after i get out of the four years in the military come home in 87 and i'm like you know really trying to figure out you know what i said like, i don't know if college is the best option or not and I said, like, you know, I just need to get money together and start my own business. I'm talking with my best friend who I'd known since first grade. And it's like, you know, man, I need to get money together. How the heck do I do this? And, and he's like, well, Kev, man, he's like, go down to Seattle. Get, get yourself a job in one of those fishing boats. Go to Alaska. Those guys, they make all kinds of money. I'm like, you know, that sounds good. <laughs> and so I did. I went down to Fisherman's Terminal and I just started hitting the docks. And Where were you living at the time? I, I live up in, in fact, you know what? I live about five miles today from where I grew up. I, I lived in Marysville. I live in Arlington now, uh, about 40 miles north of Seattle. Got it. And so, so yeah, I just drove down to Seattle, started, went down to Fisherman's Terminal, started hitting the docks and uh, <clears throat> started talking about all these captains and and they're like, you know, uh, we don't do this. We don't hire off the dock because you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> you just uh, walked up. You're like, all right, I'm ready yeah, to go. Yeah. I was like, you know, hey, I, I'm ready to work. And I want to, I've heard, you know, I'm, I, I'm, yeah, I want to go fishing in Alaska, you know. <laughs> and, and they're like, no way. And, and uh, you know, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. And uh, we, we don't hire this way. I mean, the way we hire is like from guys that already been on the boat that have already told their friends what it's like. So they got a clue at least, you know, you don't got a clue. And, and, but one guy was I mean, John Waddell was his name. He's like, you know, he's like, I, he's a, I might be a guy short. And uh, he's like, you know, um, he's like, give me your number. He's like, I ain't going to promise nothing, but he's like, give me your number. He ended up calling me a couple of days later. And he was like, how fast can you be down here? I said, I could be there in two hours. He's like, okay, get your stuff packed and get down here. He's like, when you get here, come up and see me in the wheelhouse. And when you I you have get never here, done this before. No, no. I so I'd never done this before, and neither had John. John had never done this before. And and he was just in a pinch. And he he calls me up to the wheelhouse. He's like, look, Kevin, he's like, I'm going out on a major limb here. He's like, I have never done this before. And he's like, man, he's like, I'm just hoping you don't let me down. Because he's like, if if you get up there. And you don't pull your weight. He's like, everybody else has got a cover for your ass. And he's like, and they're going to hate you by the time the trip is over. He's like, um, he's like, they, they got this bar up in Dutch Harbor uh, at the time. It was called, what the hell was the name of that bar? Um, but Playboy magazine back in the day rated it the roughest bar in the U.S. It's called the Elbow Room. That's what it is. Look, Google that shit up one day. <laughs> the Elbow Room. It's the roughest bar in the U.S. People would get killed there and all that stuff. Uh, because... Guys who didn't pull their weight on the fishing boats, the crew would get so upset that like they they come back to town and and have some drinks and just get in big brawls and fights and like that guy would not go back on that fishing boat again, you know. And so the skipper's telling me this. He's like, "Kev, I don't want this happening to you." And I'm like, "John, I, like, I promise." Talk about you. a first day pep talk, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. <laughs> 
And I just said, I promise you, I will not let you down. And uh, so he gave me the shot and we went up there. And when once we got up there, Jeremy, man, I was like, he was right. I had not a clue, man, because it was ridiculous. It was, I mean, insane. Describe, describe the scene a little bit. <clears throat> I mean, because we worked up in Alaska's Bering Sea, and you know, we're we're a typical day is it's just it's just wet, rainy, miserable, wet, cold weather. Uh, you're dealing with 20, 30 foot waves. This boat is just rocking all around. I mean, half of your job is just learning to stay on your feet and do your dang job while this boat's moving all around underneath you. Uh, and and you know, we we would work. Anywhere from 24 to 36 hours straight, Jeez. Uh, you sleep for six hours and get up and do it again. And on, on a good trip, we could fill that boat in about two weeks. Uh, on a bad trip, I'd been out at sea working under those kind of conditions, working those kind of hours for up to two months before where we, we finally just had to pack it up and go into town, even though we weren't full, because we were running out of food and fuel. <laughs> and wow. so... Um, but that was how many work. people are on the boat? Uh, typically there's, no, well, I mean, depending on which boat you go on, there's going to be say, Oh, six to eight guys. Uh, and if you're doing processing too, you're going to have another six to eight guys. If you're on a boat that does processing too. And so, so yeah, between six to 16 guys, uh, cause you got the skipper, the engineer, you got a cook who usually doubles and works on deck too and stuff. And so it's, what it's, was the toughest part about that job? You know, um, it seems I mean, like everything's pretty hard. The, but... the, the weather and and just trying to stay safe and and uh, stay on the boat in some cases because the the weather's so crazy. You're getting hit with rogue waves. Uh, I, mean, if, I mean, in fact, ninety five. That was the year that I got hit and just threw me across the boat. And that's when I was like, you know what? Uh, I, I'm done. You've saved up enough money. <laughs> So, what happened? At that uh, time? I mean, we, we were we were in one heck of a storm, and uh, uh, I was out. And, and really, you know, when when you get in a storm like that, I mean, at least for me, I, I won't speak for the other guys, but I mean, for me, I was really, I it, it's it's scary. And the way that I would deal with it is, I wouldn't look out at the horizon. I wouldn't look out at the water. I would just concentrate on my job, getting the catch onto the boat. And let the skipper do that up on the wheelhouse. And and on that night we got hit, and he he I, I'm just working away, and he's all of a sudden over the loud hitter. He's like Kevin Duck. And before I could even react, we got hit broadside with this huge wall of water, and it picked me up like I was nothing. Uh, hurled me face first all the way across the boat into the railing. I in fact I broke. Uh, my my fall with my hitting my face against the railing. That's what this this scar on my chin is from. My front teeth got knocked out there. Uh, but uh, you know, if it would have thrown me a little inch, a little, couple inches higher, You're that would have been it. You're I dead. Been, oh yeah. Dead. You know. And when uh, you were there, did anyone get thrown overboard? Uh, yes. Yeah, a couple of guys got thrown overboard during while I was up there, and and nobody on any of the boats that I was on died. Uh, we were able to get him off. Uh, really? It wasn't wow. really that storm that it happened. So that was fortunate. You got a life ring to him. But it was regular occurrence that people died. And because, you know, the, the skippers can all talk to each other on the radios up there and stuff. You heard about it immediately about man overboard, man overboard. You heard, I mean, like you, you knew when it happened, everybody in the fleet knew that it happened, you know. And then a guy lost, got lost. Jeez. So, yeah, one a little bit higher, and you're thrown overboard, and no one's getting you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're in a storm like that, because the the captain can't get the boat time turned around in time to save you. When you're in a storm, it's, it's a different thing when you're when you're not in such a nasty storm. But uh, when you're in a nasty storm like that, they're not getting that boat turned around in time to save you. You know, and so so you quit you know, at the time. You're like, this is that, that's like a, that's like a wake up call. You know, that was my wake up call. And the thing is, like, I didn't quit even like my 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 tooth when it busted out, it busted out in an angle. It exposed the nerve that and, and the tooth was yeah. at it was pointy. And so it cut my tongue, too. And, and it kept cutting my tongue. And I got so fed up with it because the skipper was like, well, you know, Kev, what, we can just take you to port. I'm like, no, 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 because like that meant shutting down the whole dang fishing operation for everybody, you know. 
And I'm like, I don't want to be the guy that makes them cut into port for like two days travel each way and stuff. I said, I'll just finish out the contract. I, I filed my tooth flat. I went down to the engine room and got one of those like oh, I don't know big okay. files, and I just filed the tooth flat so it would stop cutting my tongue. And then I would put some. I can't remember what it was called, cavit or something like that. You put on your tooth because the 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 air. Oh, the if air you are have an exposed nerve like that, it is excruciating. Oh yeah, it hurts like hell. It hurts like excruciating. hell. Excruciating. Yeah. So yeah. how did you even get? Through? You're just like, yeah, I'll walk it off. I mean, that's insane, Kevin. Well. Because I guess at that point, I, you know, that was the working up in Alaska for the seven years that I did was the hardest work I've ever done in my life. And, but it also, um, it, it was kind of like this badge of honor too, Jeremy. It was this badge of honor. Of, look at me, man. Look and my dad, my dad, from the time I was little, he had always told me, he's like, Kevin, the harder you work, the more successful you'll be. That was his experience. That was the best advice he knew to give me. And I remember how many times I thought, man, dad, if you could see me now, mm. I know you'd be proud. And so there was all of that that played into it right up until the point when I almost died. I'm like, OK, this is enough. <laughs> and uh, but even at that, I didn't want to let down the skipper. I didn't want to let down my crew members. I didn't want to be the guy who shut down the whole doggone operation. That's a lot of money for everybody, including the fishing company, you know. And I'm like, I don't want to be that guy. I was like, I'll just finish this out. I'll finish this contract. Then I'm off the boat. And and that's exactly what happened. I finished the contract, got off the boat, and never went back. And so, but I never Kevin, lost all the lessons either. <laughs> amazing um, story. Thank you. There's so many lessons in that. I totally appreciate you, your time, everything you do for everyone else and myself. Um, everyone should, you know, they can uh, reach out to you on Facebook. Um, they can email you. I don't know if you want to give your email, but they could check out tribeforleaders.com. And if you're an entrepreneur, founder, who else would be perfect for Tribe for Leaders? Yeah, I mean, on, on, you know, established entrepreneurs, CEOs, uh, you know, uh, that's the big thing. I just, you know, and, and who are also just giving, generous, lead with helping hand, people of integrity. Uh, you know, th those are the kind of people that are right fit for Tribe for Leaders. And if, if you... If, if what I shared here resonates with you, if, if uh, you know you feel like you would not only benefit from being a part of it, but also have a lot to contribute as well, I'd be happy to have a conversation. I'd be happy to have a conversation. Yeah, if you want to get on the boat with someone for Trevor Leaders who's willing to file his tooth down with an exposed nerve <laughs> and still make sure people stay afloat and the fleet is out, that's who you want. There you go. So, <laughs> Kevin, I totally appreciate you. Everyone check out tribeforleaders.com and um, we'll see you on the other side. So thanks, Kevin. Oh, my pleasure, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.